It's been three years since Claire Varel was cast into the lion's den of reality TV show, Married at First Sight. An experience that left her clinically depressed <laughs> and deeply affects her to this day. I didn't sign up to be bullied to the point that I tried to kill myself. I didn't sign up to have absolutely no support. I didn't sign up to have my life completely ripped to shreds. I didn't sign up for that. OK. <clears throat> Single and in her 30s, well, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <laughs> well. Claire really did want to get married when she signed up for the second season of the reality television juggernaut. Oh, God. <laughs> You're hot. <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> I just wanted a love story, and I thought this was the way it was going to happen. Claire, do you take Jono to be your husband from this day forward? I do. So she took her vows for the voyeuristic pleasure of a million or so viewers. <laughs> it gives me the greatest pleasure to declare that they are now husband and wife. Jono, you may now kiss the bride. I've always been, I am a bit gullible. So when they would tell me, we're not looking for drama, Claire, we're looking for love stories. Are you ready? Three, two, one. Ooh. I was like, they're looking for love stories. Ah! I really believed them. You lead, I follow. No, you lead, you're the guy. Okay. Claire now knows that what the show was really looking for was ratings. They set us up into a situation to fail. The situation that they placed me and the person I was partnered in was an impossible and potentially very dangerous situation that was cause was going to cause mental anguish and harm. What the f*** is that? It's a leak. In the hyped up world of reality yeah, television, no, yeah, just stop it now. In, bitch. every episode needs to be bigger than the one that came before it. There has to be more drama. I'm really not sure whether it was love. It, it gets confusing in there. More controversy. We thought that you were a lesbian and that was your gay best friend. More craziness. And the show's producers know exactly how to extract those Twitter-worthy moments of TV gold. Tonight, we expose all their tricks. respect. People watching these shows need to realise that even though reality is in the title, that doesn't necessarily mean that what you're watching is reality. It is actually torture. They, the sleep deprivation. You get to a point where you're so tired and you're so broken and you just want to stop that you will say whatever they feed you. Sure, it may have almost killed me, but were you not entertained? Claire Varel was naive and extremely vulnerable when she signed up for Married at First Sight. For me, um, I'd just come out of a long-term relationship that had ended quite badly. I guess I was panicked um, because everyone around me was having children and getting married. And it wasn't a reality show. It was a social experiment with psychologists behind it and all of this kind of thing. When Claire decided to marry a stranger on national television, she wasn't in a good headspace. She was emotionally vulnerable, suffering severe PTSD from a violent assault six months earlier. Claire Varal was wearing headphones during a nightly walk when a man lunged at her from the darkness and pushed her along a driveway. Then he just turned me around and slammed me against the wall. Her attacker broke her nose with a punch to the face. When you told the producers of Married at First Sight about what had happened, were they concerned about whether you were OK to go on the show? They didn't seem very concerned. I asked for additional testing around anxiety, depression and PTSD. And 
They never gave me the actual results of those tests, but they said, you're well enough to go on to the show. In fact, Claire tried to leave the show quite early in the piece, but the producers didn't want her or her storyline going anywhere, and they knew how to make her stay. We both wanted out after the, the honeymoon because we realised we were both completely incompatible and, but we were being fed things. Like, the producers would say like, no, 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 he's saying he really likes you and this and me. And I'm, I'm like, well, I have made really bad choices with my love life. Like, maybe they're right. I would put it to you that some of these shows have the ethics of a cash register. They're really not interested in the human being and their psychology. They're interested in their ratings. And I think that is disgraceful. I told them that. You told them to drown in the pool. You can drown in the pool. Psychologist Michael Carr Gregg believes more needs to be done to rein in the many excesses of the reality TV machine. I think it's irresponsible to put people on who are clearly vulnerable and then give them their 15 megabytes of fame and then expect them to cope, because many don't. We've had reality TV now for a number of years. It's time, it's regulated, but not in a censorious way, just in a way that protects the psychological well-being of the contestants. Shut up. Don't let me What do you think of Married at First Sight? Um, I think that particular show is the psychological sewer of Australian television, and it's very similar to sort of the Colosseum back in ancient Roman times, where we had whole crowds watching the lions and the Christians. It's voyeuristic, it's terrible. may just be a show for everyone else and a distant memory for everyone else, but I'll always wear the scars on my wrist from that show, always. We know that in uh, overseas shows, people have taken their own lives. Do we really have to wait till there's a suicide or some serious mental health problem that's emerged as a result of being on one of these shows before we act? I hope not. Do you think that's inevitable if we don't rein it in? I think you can take that to the bank. So that is no, I've made me a decision, I'm gonna go. You go in. Yeah. Two former reality stars in the UK have taken their own lives. My time is done. Sophie Graddon was a cast member on the reality show Love Island. She died last June. Then, nine months later, another Love Island alumni killed himself. I wouldn't say I was nasty to her or anything like that. I think people have taken it too, like, too serious and going, oh, I'm this vile person, because I'm not. Mike Thalassitis was just 24 when he appeared on the reality hookup show. I don't know what he called me, what, Muggy Mike or something? But yeah, I don't really get, I don't really get what he says about me, to be honest. 
The fame was instant, but it was also fleeting. How hard is it when that fame drops off so quickly? It's the most significant loss that you could possibly imagine. If they're not resilient, if they don't have the capacity to face, overcome, be strengthened by adversity, this is going to be a psychological punch in the stomach from which obviously some never recover. The winner of Big Brother 2012, Benjamin! Benjamin Norris spent three months locked inside a house with a bunch of strangers. When he got out of the Big Brother house, he'd won a quarter of a million dollars and lost every shred of privacy. It was one of the hardest times of my life and I wasn't prepared to deal with what I had to deal with by myself and no one understood what I was going through. And I was really suffering. I went out for dinner one night and someone had taken a photo over the stall while I was going to the bathroom and put that photo on Instagram. This was not a flattering photo. Adulation, mega prize money, Insta fame. Peering in from the outside, reality TV can seem like a golden ticket. But that's not what seduced Ben. I think it has a lot to do with validation and redemption. I think, for me, I wasn't the popular person at school. Uh, I would love to have been. I wasn't the popular person at work. And so the idea of going on to reality TV and having those people from my old school or the people that I worked with seeing me on TV was like a way of me being able to say to myself that I was okay. And that's, I think, validation. But Ben didn't get the validation he craved. Quite the opposite. I came off that show and there was Instagram, Twitter and Facebook and read everything that these people said about me. And I can honestly tell you that I don't think I was ever the same person again. And what were the worst comments you were reading? My father committed suicide in 2006 and that story broke while I was in the show. And the week after I won the show, I think people obviously wanted a different contestant to win. And someone said to me, like, um, I know why your dad killed himself. It's because he has a son like you. And I was... I wasn't prepared for that. I don't think anyone is. Oh, is this look not at this. the best board you've ever seen? <laughs> yes, it is up there. Get ready for it. It's very impressive. I love you. <laughs> when Ben was announced the winner of Big Brother, he proposed to his partner, Ben Williams. I took something into the house with me, and if I was evicted on day one, if I was told that I wasn't any good, I would have done this. That Ben has been a witness to the darker side of reality TV fame. He would get a message from a friend saying, oh, did you see this comment? Ben would be straight on it, and then up until 3 a.m. strolling through all the comments. It's easy for me to say, hey, turn it off. We love you, you're amazing. But then as soon as he's reading the next comment to say, go and kill yourself, it's a shame you were born, it cuts deep and I can understand why you wouldn't want to turn away. And do you worry about reality show stars, contestants who don't have a supportive person in their life like you? Absolutely, absolutely. I think that, um, not to blow my own trumpet, but Ben's very lucky that he had a stable home and relationship to come home to. A lot of these people, especially on dating shows where the relationship finishes, they've got no one. So, Stu. Here's your competition, the boys. <laughs> Bring back some memories? It does. Very fond memories. Cannon fodder, boys. <laughs> you weren't good enough, I'm sorry. <laughs> Stu Laundy battled 21 and, uh, blokes to win right? Sophie Monk's heart on The Bachelorette. Well, I want to take you through a few of these guys. Okay. Jared, stage five. My man. One of my besties on the show. And stood next to me at the very, very end. Unfortunately, didn't handle that loss well, did he? You know, I didn't see that coming. Jared's heartbreak was the pitiful counterpoint to Stu's giddy joy. But Soph and Stu's relationship didn't last. Why did you go on The Bachelorette? Honestly, I went on The Bachelorette looking for love. But 
You know, at the end of the day, I'm also a third generation publican and a, and a businessman. And I didn't think it would be a bad thing, any exposure to some of our hotels with, with the crowd that watches those shows. So I, I, I can't lie, I had one eye on that as well. Stu thought he was in control, but actually he was the one being manipulated, along with all the other bachelors on the show. Blakey boy was uh, painted as the villain, but uh, couldn't have been further from the truth. Ryan's got a heart of gold, uh, and he was painted as the thug, really, and he's not. He's one big beating heart. He's got a big soft heart underneath. Did you have any clue what you were signing up for? Uh, no, I didn't really... Uh, I didn't really know what I was signing up for. I didn't pick it very well. Stu's first surprise was the power the producers wielded over all their lives. You are like a caged rat in there, not knowing what's going on in society, and then they throw you onto a date, you get two minutes at a time with Sophie. Here we go. It's amazing. There's no chatting to Sophie when it's not on camera. They want the whole relationship to develop on camera. But then what happens is when the cameras get turned on, they always mix in alcohol. Uh, then you have producers pulling at a thread with emotions. But, you know, this is what they're incentivised to do. And when the producers don't get what they want on set, they simply manufacture the scene in the edit suite. I'm only trying to figure out what happened because I know how to grow stuff and... Well, maybe you don't. Was there any selective editing that took you by surprise? Yeah, so there was one really big example of this uh, weird cut and paste editing, I think you'd call it. Hey. <laughs> Sophie was meeting Stu's family for the first time. This is my sister Justine. Thank you. The producers wanted Stu's sister Justine to ask Soph if she had her sights on the family fortune. My sister didn't ask the question, but then when it got on, when it was actually on TV, somehow they cut and pasted words of my sister's from the night and the question was asked. Notice the camera isn't on Justine when she says the word money. So, Sophie, what is your ultimate game? Is it marriage? Is it kids? Money? If you let me tell you, I hope not. It would concern me. And Stu's dad? Well, his comments could have been about anything. I remember I actually watched the show, you know, when the night it was on with Justine, and she was very angry. It's a familiar cry. Contestants often claim their words have been edited to make them say things they didn't say. They can create you into whatever character they want you to be by cobbling things together. They can make you say anything. You are a character. You just don't know what the character is until it's on air. So it's a part you never read for and you probably would have said no. <laughs> Claire Varel's decision to sign up for Married at First Sight was strongly influenced by the promise that the show's psychologist would actively search out her perfect match. Psychologist Mel Schilling toured the country, interviewing single applicants in their homes. While clinical psychologist John Aiken... Hi. Nice to meet you. How are you? I'm John. ...conducted extensive psychological evaluations. Not true for Claire. She didn't meet John Aiken or Mel Schilling until after she and Jono had tied the knot. Neuropsychotherapist Dr Tricia Stratford's research involves neurological profiling. I'm interested in analysing brain activity. I never met her. Like, they say that there's all the electrodes in your brain. That never happened. I never met her. And I never met the psychologist until we were filming and I was already matched. This is the first time they truly get to gauge how they're travelling along in the experiment. Claire made a formal complaint about John Aiken being called a relationship psychologist. He's now referred to as an expert. Cabaret is pretty much tassels. Claire eventually turned to a real expert after trying to take her life a second time. I've worked really hard to get where I am now, which is a much better place, and it, I'm much, ment much more mentally strong now. Stu has coped far better with life after The Bachelorette, but it's been a bumpy road. 
What was it like when you first came off the show and you and Sophie had all of the paps watching your every move? Yeah, I had no idea uh, how intense the, the, the paps and the press and the, the magazines and the, all that sort of stuff, I had no idea how, how strong that was going to be. I, I've actually been off the coast for about 18 months since the show. So you actually fled and hid until things cooled off. That's how bad it got. Yeah. Yep, I, I, yeah, I fled Sydney. Sophie and I didn't end up together, so I'm still single, I'm still dating. When I date, and if my date ends up with a kiss, I've got some peanut hanging out of a tree with a camera. How vile are the trolls? The trolls can be super, super hurtful. See, the thing is, I didn't even know, I didn't know trolls existed. I didn't know where to read what they wrote. I've just got some great friends who would take photographs and send all the bad comments to me. The worst I got from trolls was discussions over my parenting and my children. And these people who sit in their basement and carve up people's lives without knowing something, it gives me the shits. But look, at the end of the day, it, I, I just say to, it, including all the press and the paps and just everybody involved, just, it's, here's a good idea. With you, if you've seen what's happened in the world of these shows, lay off. Looking back now on his star turn on The Bachelorette, Stu wonders what it was all about. 44-year-old me. Seems like years ago, actually. That was straight off the helicopter, I think. I still didn't know what I'd got myself in for at that point. So if you could tell that's Stu, Anything, some advice? What would you tell I him? I think I'd tell him to get back on that chopper and get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> As for Claire Varel... Would you actually consider going on reality TV for love after... Are you doing your pondering face? Are you serious? She's still struggling to make sense of her reality television experience. We're watching people rip each other apart for our entertainment and we're clapping and we're entertained. Australia, it's a TV show of manipulated characters. Wake up, be smarter. It's dangerous and someone is going to die. And that someone was very, 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 very nearly me. I'd probably quite like that and be like, oh look, he does have some balls. It must be so hard to see. It's my own child. Absolutely. Being being belittled on national television. Yeah, it's pretty revolting. This is the side of reality TV we don't see. Everybody in her life are enabling... The anguish of families having to watch their loved ones viciously and publicly torn to shreds simply for entertainment. Why are you such a big dweeb? I don't feel like you have big enough balls at all. Don't ever, don't, don't say that I don't have balls. Well, at the moment, I feel like you don't. Night after night, Colleen Vincent watched her son being put down and humiliated on national television. It's just really, really hurtful. Well, you should have used your big boy words and spoken to me. I tried to cover it up, you know, at first I'm like, no, no. You tried nah. to cover everything up, darling. All you do is try to cover up things. It was horrible. I wanted to reach into the television and grab some of the people and say, stop. Some people will sit there and go, well, these people who go on reality television shows, what do they expect to happen? That's what a lot of people say, but they're placed in a position that they can't get out of and have to endure intimidation and belittling, that's just not on. Those things are illegal. Colleen raised Billy on her own. When she was diagnosed with cancer in 2015, he moved home to look after her. She was in remission when he decided to step out of his comfort zone and apply for Married at First Sight. Billy. Hi, darling. How you doing? I said to him, are you sure? This shows everything to the whole world, not just Australia. Are you sure? And he said, yeah, it's fine. It's cool. It'll be fine. If I say to him, as most mothers, 
don't do this, you know what? They do it 10 times more. I, I don't think the experts could have picked a more perfect woman to set me up with. I'm, so, I'm stoked. I can't believe it. But things quickly changed. Susie savaged Billy relentlessly and Australia and saw every cruel insult. Do you treat her other partners like this? So I don't feel like that's been an issue in the past. No, she doesn't treat her ex-partners like this. Well, what, what is it with me? What have I done wrong? How much pain do you think Billy was in? He was in heaps of pain. For him to cry and not be able to stop, I did not, nobody expected it. I don't think I've seen any male breakdown like Billy did on national television. I'm so worn out. This is what happens when you coil up a spring. Yeah, well, the pressure has been put on me and I have been trying to make it work. And she's, I'm sorry to say, I'm not going to agree with you. She's difficult, she's nasty, and I can't stand her, to tell you the truth. So, I'm your friend. Cheers. And it wasn't just Billy in the firing line. Volatile matchups, free-flowing alcohol, and no contact with the outside world proved a surefire recipe for explosive drama that brought out the worst. Where's Tamara? Tamara! She wanted to f your husband. I was shocked and I didn't think that anybody would want to behave badly on national television. I thought there's too much shame, but I was wrong. I was frightened for my son. I was extremely worried about him during. I couldn't contact him. Um, I know it hurt him deeply. I think it would have got pretty dark. You may now kiss the bride. <laughs> Reality TV contestants signed strict confidentiality agreements so no one from the past two seasons of Maths is allowed to speak to us, including Billy. Do you think the producers of the show were fair to him? No. Because I believe that there should have been a duty of care and bullying is illegal. Belittling people is the lowest form of entertainment. The fact that that played out on national television, all for ratings and all to make a company millions of dollars, does that make your blood boil even more? Absolutely. Yeah, I think, I think reality TV's in for a big reality check. <laughs> That's already happening in Britain where the government has launched a probe into reality television after those recent suicides. I don't want what's happened in the UK to happen here. I don't want it to be everyone to be pushed and bullied to this level where someone dies and then they put up a black screen for 30 seconds and they say RIP with their name and then it's just on with the show. I don't want that to happen here. I want Australia to be better than that.